各位嘉宾，大家。Dear guests, good afternoon. Welcome to the session of redefining Made in China. I'm the moderator for this session. I'm from CCTV News. It's really an honor for me to meet all of you here. It's a very privileged for me to be here to be with the four panelists and share with all of you. I was having a conversation with the four panelists before we came to stage. I realized that uh, actually we have different views about this topic. Some people think that today we're going to talk about made in China. And others said that, oh, no, we are supposed to talk about uh, smart manufacturing. And then we reach uh, some consensus from made in China to smart manufacturing. It's a joke. In fact, what it shows is the kind of transition that we're now faced with in China's economy. So it's really an honor for me to introduce the panelists. First of all, left to me, let's welcome Mr. Feng Fei, Vice Minister, Minister of Industry and Information Technology of PRC. From the policy perspective, he's going to bring us some new ideas. We also have with us here representative of the businesses. First of all, Mr. Sun Pi Shu, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Innsbruck Group. Welcome to Madam Tina Tao, Chief Operating Officer and Partner of Innovation Works. Last but not least, Mr. Zhang Xiaogang, President, International Organization for Standardization. He's an old friend, and before he was a businessman, and now he's the president of the ISO. Welcome to the session. Now we'll get down to business. Mr. Zhang, we're old friends, so I'd like to start with you. Why did I know you? At the time, you worked in an iron and steel business in a local city in China, and uh, now you're very different. You are now a member of international organization. For those uh, traditional Chinese uh, businesses, their current performances are not that satisfying. Is it true? Thank you for the question. Good afternoon. About this subject, about this question, it's a very good one. Because uh, China is now going through transformation. And where should China's manufacturing industry go? What kind of solutions can we provide to traditional industries to address their challenges? It is very big question. We are now faced with many problems. We used, I used to work in the iron and steel industry. And the global iron and steel industry is uh, having some very severe capacity problem. It's a very severe challenge for all of us, because this is a problem for Europe, for US, for Korea, and for China. Because of this overcapacity in iron and steel industry, the whole industry is uh, under a lot of pressure. We talk about uh, China's manufacturing industry. In this transformation process, how shall we address all these difficulties and challenges? It's a very relevant topic. Personally, in industries with excess capacity, the only way out, they will have to upgrade and transform. That's the only solution. President Xi Jinping talked about three transformations not very long ago. And this represents some of the best solutions. For China's manufacturing industry, we should shift from made in China to create in China. Speed should be shifted to quality. So these are some of the simple shifts or transformations, but this is very relevant to the topic we have here. And then about products from China, we should have this transformation from products of China to brands of China. So these transformations can represent the problems we have and the solutions we have. Only if we have breakthroughs here will China's manufacturing industry be able to address the overcapacity issue and uh, the upgrading problems. For different sectors, for different industries, we need to apply different uh, approaches. For iron and steel industry, if we look at China and uh, Europe or US, 
On the surface, problems are very similar, but in fact, the reasons are different. We cannot address these problems with the same approach. In Europe or US, the iron and steel industry is the industry in a mature market economy. The market dynamics have helped uh, formulate uh, a mature industry, so they have already restructured, so their capacity can meet the need of the local economy when the local economy was growing very fast. But because of the cr financial crisis, because of the economic crisis, I think that probably we should not talk too much about Europe or US, we should talk about uh, manufacturing in China. Let's uh, be more focused. Talking about China's industrial sectors, I believe that Mr. Sun has a lot to say. You seem to be having two roles because you are in both the traditional industry and also you are in the new industry. So can you briefly talk about uh, what you do? It is a smart choice to make. Why didn't you just reinvent yourself? and effect a real transformation immediately. You are very right. For Innsbruck, my company, it's a server producer. We also do cloud computing center. We are a traditional IT business. We have cloud plus devices. We should also connect what we do with big data. We should transform ourselves into cloud service uh, providers. So we're also in this uh, transitioning or transformation process. For this process, time-wise, challenge-wise, what is your take on your business? You know your business best, right? For my company, we are designing and manufacturing servers. In the meantime, we want to also reinvent ourselves into a big data and cloud service provider. We are providing cloud service to businesses and to the government agencies. So we want to be a big data player. We talk about made in China or smart manufacturing. In Chinese, they sound very similar. But it takes a process to transform from made in China to smart manufacturing. Here, big data play a very important role. Big data sounds like a very empty word. What is cloud? Big data, it's uh, very confusing. We believe that big data play very big role in the fourth industrial revolution. Together with the government agencies and the businesses, we are providing solutions. We talk a lot about supply side reform. So what can the demand side provide to supply side? We need to have the data. We know that things are changing on the supply side, but where are the data to show all these changes? Mr. Feng, Minister Feng, is now actually doing a lot. We have a lot of data, a lot of the industrial data, sectoral data, then we should be able to capture all these changes on the supply side. Oh, no, excuse me, on the demand side. When these uh, data are fed to the supply side, and the supply side will be able to adapt uh, what they do to this change of the, of the uh, demand side. So you are telling yourself what are the changes. The big data can tell you what are the actual demands or needs of the industries. I can tell one. According to some statistics, Chinese consumers buy a lot of stuff uh, overseas in a value of uh, some 100 billion US dollars, which represents, of course, a very small part of the total consumption of the Chinese consumers. I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Feng. If we're able to meet all these needs, then this means that we are successful, but now it's not the case. And from the perspective of decision makers, how can we really accelerate this process of uh, transformation of quality so that uh, the middle class consumers in, in China can really buy the stuff they want from China's manufacturers. China's manufacturing industry is in a process of transformation. It is now at a very critical stage. I probably can use two sentences to describe the problems that the manufacturing industry is faced with. First of all, it is the lacking of uh, the 
effective demand. Second, the lacking of the effective supply. The supply is not uh, uh, really meeting the demand. As you said, a lot of the Chinese consumers are actually going to other markets to buy stuff. So we need to address these two major issues. Essentially, we need innovation as a driver or an engine globally. As said by Professor Schwab, there is the fourth industrial revolution. In China, we call it a new round of uh, technology re revolution and uh, industrial transformation. Seven or eight years ago, I was a researcher in economic and industrial policies. Between the governments and academia, there were a lot of uh, debates and discussions at that time. If you look at uh, innovation cycle and uh, economic cycle, they seem to have the kind of relations. When the economy is down, actually, innovation is, in fact, very brisk. Historically, that's a kind of uh, phenomenon and a pattern. We encountered a very big financial crisis. Will this trigger some kind of global industrial revolution? After several years of uh, discussion and exploration, it seems that we are reaching more and more consensus. That is to say, the new generation of uh, information technology and internet technology are deeply integrated with uh, manufacturing technology. So this is a consensus that we have reached. There are two characteristics. First of all, high penetration of these industries into the different industrial sectors, as well as the penetration into the whole value chains of these industries. Second, zero marginal cost effect. So these are the two very important characteristics. So what does, what does this mean? First of all, productivity improvement. For the previous industrial revolutions, so, such as the steam engine, electrification, they emancipated uh, people's uh, labor. And this time, it's about people's brain power. That is very, very much related to the smart idea. Second, it is about the change in the organization of the production. We used to have mass production, and uh, it is shifting to this new era of uh, bespoke manufacturing and production. And thirdly, there is the revolution in the way of uh, resource allocation. Based on internet, we'll be able to employ the best uh, manufacturing and innovation resources across the world. And fourthly, platform economy the organization of the production, the networking of the businesses, the flattening of the businesses, it's a new trend. And f finally, we are seeing a lot of uh, new um, forms of economy. For example, sharing economy or mobility economy. A lot of the new things are coming up. So we are now in this age of change. Thank you for all this sharing very much related to history and to philosophy. So Mr. Sun and uh, Mr. Tong, after their speaks, and uh, Mr. Tao. So just now we mentioned the, the general structures, and uh, then we know that you are going to implement those structures. We know that your company is something which catches a lot of attention. But in a lot of innovation projects you are embarking on now, and what are their types, mainly in what sectors, what kind of uh, demands do they have, what prospects do the entrepreneurs see in China, So, and what's your relationship with them as investors, what are they lack of, and what advantages do they have? Can you give us a brief introduction? Yes, thank you. I'm very honored today because I'm not only representing the entrepreneurs in China, but also 
but also the entrepreneurs all over the world. But you actually are investor. You do not represent them. Yes, I work with them every day, and I see, I meet with a politician and also the successful business person and entrepreneur. And I think you are the models for me to learn from in the past seven years. And our project probably is just within the scope of the. Um, responsibilities of the minister, and it's mainly the internet-based technology. It's a kind of a computer-based technology as well. And in the past seven years, we have seen a lot of changes with this technology. And uh, in the at the very initial stage, and it was only understood better by the community by the mobile phone, such as the mobile games and etc. But now it's more related to the different aspects of the economy, either from the perspective of transportation, just as the DD, um, taxi, and um, so because uh, it's a kind of a sharing economy, and uh, it's just uh, it's backed by the mobile platforms, and so we are also in the field of the digital entertainment, uh, the mobile games. And internet-based education, extra uh, curriculum ed education, and uh, the online education and the courses from overseas countries, and also the consu consumer area. So just now, the speaker also mentioned that uh, uh, President Xi in China said that. Uh, the consumer products in China need to have their own brands. So today we talk about a one a brand, and we talk about the upgrading of the brand, the O2O or Internet Plus. So all these are the spheres. So we embark on the, and also we embark on the artificial intelligence, intelligent manufacturing, and the big data algorithms, chips, and etc. So I will just stop here, um, Minister. Mr. Minister, Ms. Tao um, gave us uh, introductions about the latest developments. And uh, besides, we need to be faced uh, with uh, one issue, that is uh, manufacturing 4.0. But compared with that, uh, we are still lagged behind. Uh, and uh, like we mainly have the 2.0, 3.0, like automation and inform inform Monetization, and uh, so when we transform one economy, mainly it's a transform about uh, the top players. So, from the perspective uh, of the new starters and to the main players, and uh, what is the distance between them? What is the current status uh, or the current picture for the whole gen general situation? As you have rightly mentioned, China's transformation is very complicated. In Germany, and uh, they talk about uh, industry 4.0, but uh, we are actually in uh, manufacturing 2.0, 3.0. This means uh, that uh, China has uh, a wider variety of different stages of the manufacturing, and so this is uh, one special feature to the Chinese industries. And China's industrialization is very compact or con condensed or intensified because we have only used several decades to go through the process that the Western countries have used uh, uh, several like hundred years. So in this uh, process, we are we have a lot of complexity, and then we may pay more attention to the traditional sectors first uh, about how to upgrade it, how to upgrade the, the traditional sectors. If we look at the current data for the high tech manufacturing. It has a, a strong momentum for growth, but it only accounts for about 12 percent of the total manufacturing. So the majority of the manufacturing is still about the traditional manufacturing and about how we can transform them. So I think that in the upgrading of the traditional manufacturing, uh, we need to look at the different the special characteristics of each and every sector in the manufacturing. As you mentioned, the iron and steel sector, it has uh, the overcapacity issue, and uh, it also has issues related to the upgrading, and uh, also about uh, the advanced equipment and manufacturing in the, ap the application in the iron and steel uh, industry, and uh, about uh, the traditional sectors such as textiles and clothing. We also see a lot of successful cases of uh, transformation, such as uh, bespoke and tailor-made clothing, 
and based on different uh, preferences and shapes, and uh, so the um, very customized uh, clothes is made. We have a lot of uh, such successful cases. So the, uh, it's a combination of the traditional sector and some artificial manufacturing. On this regard, we have already found some best practices. But still, uh, these uh, best practices uh, are not uh, the mainstay or uh, we, we need to spread them and to make them to become the mainstream so that uh, the traditional sectors will be further upgraded to the most optimal status. Ms. Tao and uh, the minister just now mentioned about uh, the upgrading of the traditional se sectors as a whole. And uh, so in this uh, process of transformation and upgrade, upgrading some the platforms for the new economies of the sharing economies uh, and some business models uh, may be criticized uh, as uh, the challenges to the traditional sectors in terms of uh, providing employment and allocation of the social resources. So from the perspective of investors, what's your view about this issue? Certainly, investors would invest in the good projects, but uh, uh, also there are social consequences uh, of investment. Uh, what's your view about that? I would like to also ask uh, the Mr. Sun, who has two roles. Uh, certainly, you have more ideas about this. So, Ms. Tang. So, the industrial upgrading each time causes uh, one type of job to disappear and at the same time creating a lot of uh, new types of jobs. Uh, so it doesn't mean that the emergence of new sector means a disaster, but it takes time, right? And uh, because some people uh, lose their jobs and lose their existing benefits. Yes, that's right. Uh, either a company or workers will get uh, some impacts. That's why we have a concept of uh, lifelong learning that means we need to keep up with the uh, paces of the era, and uh, everybody needs to improve its, uh, her or himself. And uh, so Mr. John just now mentioned about uh, the traditional sectors, overcapacity, iron and steel sectors. Some people will lose their jobs. And the Premier Li Keqiang also mentioned that the government uh, and the businesses so need to help these people. But uh, actually, we have the, the sharing economy can help ups, create additional jobs for them. For example, like the DD, uh, this uh, application, this platform has actually creates a lot of job opportunities uh, for many drivers, and uh, not only the taxi drivers, but uh, the different types of drivers. So this uh, not only helps solve the employment issue, but also help to provide more means of transportation for the general public. The minister also just now mentioned the uh, bespoke. Um, on the one hand, we have the over oversupply from the traditional sectors. On the on the other hand, and uh, um, there's a lot of uh, demands which are not met, such as we have investment in Shanghai Idea Lab. It's about uh, the production of the textiles and uh, the silk products, uh, the equipments are very expensive. Since the equipments are expensive and they're just uh, scattered around uh, the smaller fan uh, factories, so in the past, uh, then we didn't have the big data on this regard because uh, and we all these equipments are scattered uh, and uh, the customers are not satisfied with the products and we don't know what customers like. And now, for the Yangtze River Delta, and we just integrate all the facilities, all the machines into one virtual platform. And uh, so then one designer can just uh, uh, use, have access to this platform. And uh, the designer can also make bespoke designing for the customer. So that means that uh, they can make use of the existing resources and not wasting anything, and also can satisfy the needs of the demands of the customers. Besides, manufacturing is related to hardware. For example, we have an intelligent uh, piano. This intelligent piano sells for uh, number one in the world, and also it won uh, the big award in Las Vegas. So it's uh, the piano yearly for the kids and um, professionals, but the intelligent pianos 
are also suitable for the a for the senior people and because uh, they are and very easy to play and also very uh, low cost for learning and because if you just uh, use a pad and you can learn this uh, how to learn how to play this piano so you um, I have uh, over 200 projects in the pipeline and so I would say that uh, the manufacturing this type of manufacturing is in China and uh, we have also invested in the projects uh, in the United States uh, including the the manufacturing um, of the intelligent equipments and but the, the real manufacturing really happens in Guangzhou in Dongguan city so but uh, for the investors, usually you look at uh, the return of investment, and you look at the prospect of the projects, and uh, you also you look at uh, whether they are sustainable and also will bring benefits to the society. But uh, Minister Feng, uh, and uh, this is actually also about the competition of the different uh, stakeholders and the benefit, the people who have the different benefits, and uh, so who, which companies do you select to help, and what kind of sub subsidies do you give to the laid-off workers, and what companies have the potential to move on to the next stage, what companies uh, you will choose to give more training, and uh, what companies uh, will have to totally change their direction of development. So all these are the challenges for the policymakers. Besides, we have the different uh, departments of the government uh, responsible for the different matters. So um, Mr. Feng, from the pers perspective of policymaking, at this uh, critical stage, what are the important things to consider in terms of the policymaking? Besides, what's the role of the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology? Our ministry is responsible for the supply side, especially the supply side of the manufacturing sector. I think the key link is to, or the key part is about creating an ecosystem which is favorable for innovation. Then it is related to policies, uh, incentive mechanisms, uh, management uh, and governance models, uh, and etc. The incentives for innovation and uh, this whole ecosystem, it uh, seems to be easy to say, but uh, how to as to how to achieve it, we need to have a very detailed, in-depth analysis so as to come up with uh, very accurate policies. We know that uh, some sectors are having some disruptions and the disruption to the uh, the previous ecosystem and also with uh, newcomers and also disruption to the traditional manufacturing models and operational models. So in this process, we need to balance the economic issues and uh, the social issues. The social issues uh, are the employment issues and et cetera. And so just now, you mentioned that who will select the markets, who, who will select the businesses for further growth. Uh, we, we do not play that role. The market will play that role. And uh, we just need to strike a balance between the surplus of the producers and uh, the surplus of the consumers. Then the producers need to have e enough capability for innovation and also enough uh, sur surplus. And then consumers should be able to fully benefit from innovations. So the government should be striking a balance between these two. In this process, we need to have institutional innovations, which are very important. In institutional innovations, most importantly, it's uh, inclusive inclusiveness. In the past, our policies were mainly about uh, managing existing things. We regulated existing things, but we are now faced with a lot of unknown and changing things. We cannot really predict all of them. Because of that, we we'll have to keep innovating on the institutional front. Made in China 2025 uh, reflects this uh, idea. 
That is to say, we need to create a good industry eco environment and practice people centered uh, talent strategy. as well as improving the overall system of uh, manufacturing innovation. Essentially, we want to unlock the market power and uh, the power of technology innovation. Thank you. Mr. Zhang, just now Minister Feng made a lot of encouraging remarks from the perspective of decision makers and policy makers. In the meantime, we should uh, recognize that uh, to transform from made in China to smart manufacturing, we need to have the change of the mentality and mindset. We seem to need a lot of space. How big is uh, the space that people can have? So Mr. Zhang used to work in the traditional industry, and now, of course, you are having a new role. You now talk a lot about international standards. Uh, today, we're not talking about standards, but you used to be an entrepreneur, a businessman. So can you talk about the kind of uh, policy space that you would need to transform? We are all the stakeholders, and what is your view on your own role and how you should uh, communicate with other stakeholders as well as the policy makers. Minister Feng mentioned a lot of policies. For China's uh, transformation, very importantly, we need to give attention to quality. And quality, of course, is related to standards. Without the support of the standards, we cannot have good quality. This has been fully testified uh, by the experience of Japan and uh, Germany. There are also lessons from many other countries about quality and the standards. In his uh, government work report, uh, Premier Li talked about uh, craftsmanship. Craftsmanship is very important. Germany has very good manufacturing sector. A lot of uh, international standards uh, were proposed uh, by the German businesses because uh, Germany and the German manufacturing businesses have always aimed for the best quality in their production. In China's transformation, how shall we achieve this? Standards play a very important role in improving quality. Mr. Sun talked about smart cities. All, all countries are now working on smart cities. What are standards for smart cities? There are some 700 cities in China which are working on smart city programs. Many other International cities also working on the smart cities, and three major international organizations, stand, uh, international stand organization, also developing their own standards. If we are all doing that, then after five or ten years, we'll see that it's a lot of waste of uh, resources, time, and uh, uh, energy. That is why the three main stand organizations are now working together to develop uh, the common standards for smart cities. In China's transformation process, standards are going to play a very important role. So for China to transform from China speed to China quality, we will have to rely on the power of the standards. Thank you very much. It seems that you now prefer standards, right? So now I'd like to ask uh, this question to Mr. Sun. What do you need? What is lacking? If you don't need any policy space, then um, probably my understanding was wrong. From a business perspective, Businesses are the market entities and participants. Of course, all the businesses want to have equal opportunities to compete in the market. That's number one. Secondly, for some key sectors, I believe that government should really develop and issue relevant policies. I think that all countries do that. For some critical industries and sectors, some key technologies, the government should uh, pool resources to crack the nuts. And then on the other hand, of course, the government should reduce uh, interferences into businesses. Premier already said that uh, the government would uh, streamline its bureaucracy and leave more things to businesses. The businesses are the market participants. They are the market entities. They are adults. You should not treat the businesses as uh, like little children. 
or babies. They should uh, have their own say. They should get their own decision made. So these are things I need. Ms. Madam Tao, from perspective of the investor, we're not saying what the government should do for you or for us. Rather, we're talking about different stakeholders in this process. What should be the roles of the different stakeholders so that we can really drive this transformation from made in China to smart manufacturing. So what is your view on the current investment environment? What are your thinkings? For my sector, there are three things. Or th there are three groups of people are most important. One is the entrepreneurs and then investors. And the thirdly, policy makers. For the three groups of people, they should uh, have uh, good interactions at the right time and uh, at right locations. China already talked about uh, the mass entrepreneurship and mass innovation. So from the supply side of the entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of the power has been unlocked. We're seeing a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, some of them are fresh graduates from university, and some of uh, the managers from established businesses are now starting their own startups. What do I need? Two more things. One, for these entrepreneurs or young entrepreneurs, they would need help to turn their startups into established businesses. One is a fair opportunity to take part in competition. As said by Premier Li in the morning, we need to create a level playing field for businesses, small or big, fair opportunities, fair market access. This also concerns money or fund. For a startup, VC and angels can provide initial funding. When they become a middle-sized company, of course, they need more funding. They need a credit line from the banks. Because big companies tend to enjoy very good uh, lending terms, but unfortunately, a lot of small ones don't really have this, but they also need it. In a lot of industry, they also access thresholds or barriers sometimes. But you know, for big businesses, it takes a process for them to build credit, right? So Mr. Sun does not really agree with you because he, is both, he both works in the traditional and the new industries. Innovation will be needed. Actually, things are becoming better now. Because in the past, you would have to have fixed assets as collaterals, and now the banks are accepting IPRs as collaterals. These are change. These are innovations. The state-owned banks should also be encouraged to accept these new things and to have innovations. And finally, as an investor, essentially, of course, we need to make exits from successful investments. How can we get this money back? There are a number of ways. One, the entrepreneurs will just give the money back to us when they become very successful. And second, so my business is good, and I sell my business to Mr. Zhang and Mr. Sun. And then it could be an IPO. The public market would recognize your company's value. For the last part, we need policy support. So the source has already been opened. We have got a lot of entrepreneurs. And where are the exits? How can we get all this money back? We haven't done enough. We eliminated uh, some new board. And the rules of the new third board become very restrictive. If the exits are not uh, good enough, then probably there could be a problem. So you already asked for a lot of things. I'd like to ask the Minister Feng to respond to you. Of course, your ministry cannot really solve all these problems. We fully understand and appreciate this. But in the meantime, we can see that uh, whether we are in the traditional sector or the new sectors, whether we're talking about now or the future, there are some of the structural problems or structural policy issues which uh, are very similar. So I'd like to ask uh, Minister Feng to respond to the ideas uh, proposed by the three entrepreneurs and investors. So what should I do? What should you do if the government does everything? Um, we help entrepreneurs. It seems that there are two things here. 
one, mass entrepreneurship and mass innovation. For startups, particularly high tech startups, in their growth process, there could be market access issues, it could be funding issues, investors' exit channels. How can investors really reap benefits from their investments? All these institutional designs are very important. The Chinese government is now streamlining, streamlining its bureaucracy, delegating more power. The MIT is also developing the mass entrepreneurship and uh, mass uh, innovation platform based on internet. With all these policies, we are trying to build a good environment for the startups. As for funding, market-based VCs and PEs are very active in China. For some strategic emerging industries, the government is also guiding and encouraging funds to support relevant businesses. As for commercial financing or lending, the MIT is also encouraging the commercial financial institutions to give more lending to the SMEs. Financing innovations are also important. For example, IPR as uh, collateral, receivable as collateral. So these are some of the financial innovations that we are now pushing. So this is about support for those uh, innovative uh, startups. Second, about uh, the big businesses, traditional industries upgrading and transformation. For the established and the big companies, they also have their role to play in innovation and transformation. They also have their own advantages because these uh, large enterprises have a greater ability to have the scale operation. So how can we unlock and fully leverage the advantage of these big enterprises? We believe that uh, we can leverage these big businesses to build uh, platforms of mass entrepreneurship and innovation. For example, there could be industrial clouds. Um, Hire also has a platform for mass entrepreneurship and innovation. China Mobile also has their own platform of innovation and entrepreneurship. So these big enterprises build platforms for innovative SMEs or startups. In this we can we can leverage the advantages of these big enterprises. Thank you. We talk a lot about uh, each other's needs, policy support, the communication between policymakers and uh, stakeholders. Here it's an international forum. So I'd like to address another issue with you. In the future global landscape, how should China position its uh, manufacturing? If we look at other countries, what are the lessons and experiences can we redraw from them? Mr. Zhang talked about Germany. Germany, of course, has uh, their well-developed manufacturing sector. Not long ago, the President Obama of the United States also mentioned uh, of uh, creating a new manufacturing center in California, and before he leaves his current position as a president, and he uses this way of making more publicity. And besides, in the developed countries, and there's a lot of discussions about the manufacturing in China. And besides, we need to also mention the country Japan, because Japan is in a different stage of development from China, and it's advanced manufacturing in the past decades have has been severely impacted, especially in the context of the new economy. And how can the Chinese companies learn from them uh, in terms of the experience and the lessons? And uh, another country, India, and some people are asking that whether the manufacturing center of India will surpass that of China. 
and from the perspective of an uh, entrepreneur, and uh, how do you view China's current stages, uh, current uh, status of development, and uh, how do you view the lessons and the experiences from other countries, from the both the developed countries and the emerging countries as well, who are keeping up quickly? So we are talking about Germany for the detailed, uh, um, very advanced manufacturing, but uh, Japan is also a good example for us to learn from for the quality control, for the advanced manufacturing. But pro probably because of the political reasons, uh, we do not have a lot of uh, researchers uh, on the advanced manufacturing of Japan. So China is now learning a lot from Germany because we have favorable policies toward uh, Germany, and we also need to learn from Japan. At the very beginning stage of uh, reform and opening up, we learned a lot from Japan and about the quality control and uh, about uh, you know the rice cooker and the toilets and uh, now people a lot of people buy the uh, toilet covers and the uh, rice cookers from Japan. So I think that we also need to learn a lot from Japan. When we go global, on the one hand, we need to also increase the quality of the products. Second, when the manufacturers go global, they should also bring along with them the latest technologies and products. It's not only about the selling products. It's it's. In order, to, we we should also help create the jobs in the local region, so as to get rid of the trade conflicts, uh, and uh, we should also help the local development uh, instead of just uh, selling the low-quality products to the local uh, regions in the overseas countries. Uh, and uh, it's then will be not only about the market acquisition, but also about uh, helping the local economy to grow. So then the images of the business and the country will be changed totally, if so. Mr. Zhang. The first issue, we need to learn from Germany and Jap Japan. So the most important thing is about the spirit of the craftsmanship. And if we want to uh, adapt uh, the manufacturing sector, and we need to make it more voluntary, a kind of uh, voluntary spirit to make things well, good, and better. And uh, China's manufacturing sector certainly will embrace transformation, because when the cost is uh, becoming higher and higher, certainly, and uh, the it will be relocated uh, to other countries. So I think that uh, China is uh, it's quite necessary for, for this kind of uh, transformation. And uh, Ms. Tao, from the perspective of the investor, what's your thinking? And uh, in the, um, the investment environment may be different. Uh, and for the startup investment in Japan, Japan is not as good as in China. And uh, mainly the investment model is that so it's quite difficult for the startup companies to survive. In Japan, in the past several years, uh, there has been great development. Uh, before, there was almost no VC in India, but in the past several years, more attention was given to India because uh, there was more potential or prospect for the Indian market itself, and especially for the very fundamental um, industries repeating that uh, in the 1980s and 1990s in China, Mr. Long. And, and so now it's in a kind of rebalancing period of the for the global economy, and mainly in two aspects. The first is uh, that uh, the manufacturing and the real economy, and uh, globally speaking, uh, is a uh, very hot topic, and also is uh, ca also catches a lot of attention from the advanced countries to step out of the global financial crisis and to invest more in the real economy has become the consensus shared by all countries. And uh, we also talk about uh, the new round of uh, industrial revolution and uh, industry upgrading. So this will also bring a lot a lot of uh, big impact. So we are faced with such a kind of environment as a very large manufacturer in the world. Our, in 2010, our total output from manufacturing sector was number one in the world. But we are big. We are not very strong. 
In terms of uh, technologies, uh, management, and policies, we should also learn from other countries. So in China, in the process of um, manufacturing transformation, we need to learn and also compete in the new round of uh, industrial revolution. So we, are, we have faced with new tasks. Generally speaking, we work with other countries and also compete with them. I per my personal view is that our collaboration uh, overweight the competition. They, we, the whole world is in the process of uh, transformation, and uh, we also need to explore what ways we can use for this uh, transformation. And uh, we need to also embrace with other countries together the opportunities and cope with the challenges in the process of transformation so as to create a beautiful global prospect brought forth by the new round of industrial revolution. And we still have 10 minutes to go. And uh, then we will raise the floor for questions. And just now, I just raised uh, the basic questions. I know that uh, you will ask uh, more professional uh, questions. And uh, then uh, the floor is open for the Q&A. And uh, please raise your hands. We will pass a microphone to you. And uh, please just uh, simply use uh, one sentence to identify yourself. And also raise your question straightforwardly. So a lady over there. I'm the journalist from Binghai Times newspaper, and uh, I would like to ask you uh, that Tianjin is also R&D center of advanced manufacturing. That's its uh, positioning. So in the background of Tianjin-Beijing Hebei integration project, uh, what's the role of Tianjin? And uh, how do you further promote R&D and uh, manufacturing in this region from the perspective of the government? So it's about the importance of the R&D. OK, so min minister, and uh, please answer this question. Thank you for your question. This is a very key question. R&D. Research and development uh, is uh, Related to the industrialization, from the perspective of the government, uh, we also look at uh, the three areas, uh, basic R&D, second is applicational R&D, and uh, also the product side development. So in the process of promoting R&D, innovation is something we must do as a, fun as a foundation, globally speaking. Different countries are uh, paying a lot of attention to the manufacturing innovation, such as uh, uh, President Obama's uh, initiative and also China's uh, Manufacturing R&D Innovation Center. By 2015, we have uh, about uh, 15 different R&D innovation centers, uh, so all network-based. Uh, we pay more attention to the technology investment and uh, studies before the competition really happens. Then is uh, more. The next stage is about the industrialization, which is related to the responsibilities uh, and roles of the companies. OK, thank you for your answer. Then this, uh, pers this gentleman here. OK, I'm from Tianjin Reineng. Uh, electrics. Uh, my name is Zhang Liang, and we are in a manufacturing sector for the new energy. And uh, we also provide services and also provide uh, solutions. So two questions, one to Mr. Zhang. If we look at the whole world, from made in China to create in China, does China have uh, the relevant criteria and standards uh, to be the top ones? Uh, in the world, uh, Mr. Feng, and uh, for our company, we also want to transform our businesses, and uh, we do need to get the support of the government policies and to have those uh, policies implemented 
and uh, also the support policies from the fiscal department and from the central bank. So what kind of measures can the government take to make those policies play a better role in the implementation followed by the companies? Thank you for your question. This is a good question. China is now in the current stage. Mm. So the first uh, tier one uh, companies uh, make uh, standards, and tier two brands, uh, tier three products. So one friend asked me whether uh, we they can help to make the standards, uh, and I also, I talked with uh, the chairman of uh, technology um, about this, and the Tulsa is actually the best uh, standard uh, maker. So. So that means uh, the Tesla has uh, this kind of decision making for the standards. Uh, so that means you can, if you can be the t tier one company and you can make the standards. Uh, thank you, mi Mr. Minister. Thank you for your okay. Thank you for your qu question. You have raised uh, your hopes and expectations. Uh, second, you also seem to be a little disappointed, uh, or you have some requirements about the implementation of the policies in your company, and uh, we we want to make the policies of uh, benefit all companies. Uh, the Idea, the idea for the policy is uh, more about the general policy instead of a selective policy. The selective policy means that some companies can enjoy while others cannot. But our idea is about making the policies universally available to all companies, like uh, the, your company in terms of uh, the marketing and uh, the service uh, companies and sectors. We have the different uh, policies. And uh, this kind of universal policies are available on the website of our ministry. Uh, OK, just uh, one question, please. I'm the China region CEO of uh, Indonesia Li Bao Group. So this is a company to develop the larger complex. Uh, and we know that uh, we uh, our business is uh, negatively impacted by uh, so by the market condition for the smart or intelligent service do you have the relevant policies to support so everybody is asking for very favorable policies from the government uh, and, and, and manufacturing in 2025 uh, and there is a plan for e1 plus x and uh, plan, and uh, one of which is uh, the guidance or guideline policy about uh, service sectors. Uh, one part of the content is about the uh, intelligent service and the internet-based uh, services. Yes. The service uh, scope is uh, largely expanded based on internet, and the value, added, uh, value is added, and the new scope of service is also added. Uh, I think the policy is going to be published uh, very soon. And uh, there are a lot of uh, questions coming up. Uh, and this uh, gentleman here, I have a question. Where, where are you from? Uh, I'm, I'm from the China management uh, new media, Sheng Sixing. And uh, so there's a lot of discussion about the transformation of the manufacturing. Uh, and uh, many managers. Uh, of this sector are uh, risk aversive. Uh, Ms. Tao, you have invested in a, a lot of projects uh, uh, in the manufacturing sector. And uh, how do you convince or persuade the smaller manufacturers to buy the new services and new technologies? All the businesses have the sense of crisis because they all have their middle age crisis. They want to have uh, longevity. They want to thrive on a continual basis. So they will start with uh, cloud service, and then they will do renting. It's not a one-time purchase. Second, uh, make it work. If they get to see that it works, then of course they will buy more and more. It's not like a one-time purchase. So introduce yourself, and then one sentence question. My question, uh, who can you identify yourself? I'm a entrepreneur. I'm working on the manufacturing of uh, bespoke products 
in a standardized way, we can achieve uh, uh, manufacturing of uh, tailor-made products. For Mr. Feng, for industrialization 4.0, do we have any specific policies to support entrepreneurs like me? As said by Mr. Feng, the policies are universal. Um, but my answer may not be right, so I can still ask Mr. Feng to give his answer. Well answered. Well answered. Can you directly respond to the question? About uh, smart manufacturing, there can be different uh, pathways. For many businesses, they are a little unsure about what they should do at an, the initial stage. Last year, we did quite a lot of uh, demonstration of uh, applications. For six categories, we did these demonstrations. This year, we are going to do more demonstrations. And some of the technologies, for example, industrial internet, um, this can be integrated with uh, internet. Last question. I know that you have a lot of questions. But time is really limited. Uh, I was given a signal to wrap up this conversation. So you are very lucky. I'm a tutor for entrepreneurs. I have a question for Madam Tao. For investors, when they're facing entrepreneurs and startups and uh, businesses, we can see that a lot of the investors want to invest in A round or uh, rounds after a, um, after a, but rather they don't want to uh, leave. They want to invest in the angel stage. I think that I should. We we want to really leave the opportunities to those uh, rich uh, individuals uh, or the businessmen who are willing to make investment uh, at the angel stage. But with the A round and um, round after A, then of course the institutions will play a bigger role because uh, with this A round and a later round, of course, so a lot of metrics, financial indicators and market metrics so will play very important guiding roles. So I think that all the startups, all the young entrepreneurs should find the right kind of investors for their own businesses at different stages. I can even give a lesson on this. Yes, it's important. Probably it does deserve uh, a course in future. We have already used all our time. I'd like to thank all the panelists for your contributions. Thank you very much. Thank the audience for your contribution and uh, your intervention. Thank you for sharing. Thanks.